This is Next Radio. With Broadcast Bionics, innovative solutions for creative people. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Bruce Daisley. Uh, I guess I, I sort of really uh, wrote this presentation because I was invited by the Radio Centre. I spoke at the Radio Festival last year. And the Radio Centre asked me to come back and speak to an event of theirs, uh, just saying what really I'd learned since I left radio. So, so if you forgive me, it's not in, attempted uh, to be anything didactic, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and give you five learnings that I've had since I, I left commercial radio. So I, I briefly uh, I left commercial radio. I was at uh, EMAP, at Capital Radio before that. So all these company names that no longer exist. And, uh, and I, radio was always my first love. So, so it was always the medium. It's still the medium I adore the most now. Uh, I went from there to work at Google, at YouTube for four years, and now work at Twitter. So I'm going to talk you through uh, what I learned. I've actually, while the, there's not a, a great deal of substance what I'm going to show, uh, I've loaded all the links there. So there are a few things that I've put on. And if you are interested, bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash hacking radio has all of the slides on it. So I guess the first thing I'm going to talk about, so this is how I got my job in commercial radio. I, I applied uh, as a student in Birmingham. I applied with a cartoon CV to Capital Radio. And uh, I, I used to have glasses, so that was sort of like a, a fairly decent approximation of me. That was, that was how I got into working in radio, and my adoration for, for radio is untarnished by time. And so, but w th I think the, the thing really that I noticed over the preceding few years is how uh, decisions are increasingly different in the way they work. So decisions used to be made on the basis. Do you remember the, how this worked? The oldest person in the office normally had more experience than everyone else. And so the, the badge of honour of having worked in an industry for 30 years somehow meant that you were, you were going to have a greater approximation of the, the truth when it came to making decisions. And I think the thing that probably that we're all very well acquainted with now is how change has, has really ripped that up. And I adore this book. I don't know if anyone's read this book. But one of the, what this book by Daniel Kahneman looks at, and it's probably the best book you can read uh, looking at behavioural economics and the reasons why people make decisions. The one thing he talks about time and time again in this book is heuristics. So rules of thumb. And that's sort of how everything used to work. Rules of thumb meant that someone who had been in radio 30 years had more rules of thumb than someone else. The, the longer you stayed around, the more you'd seen a difficult negotiation, the more you'd seen a power outage. The, the things that we all start to learn and understand actually experience counted for something. I think increasingly what's happened over the last few years is that certainty and the heuristics no longer have the same impact. And so I'm going to take you through the five things that I think I've learned from some of the companies I've been at. First one I'm going to do is, is a founding principle of Google. Google, when they floated about uh, 12 years ago, they published a document that, was, that included their founding principles. And in amongst that, you will find the, the well-known uh, don't be evil. But one of them, and I think it's point number one in the, in the document, is, is this founding principle, users first, last, and always. And I, I know that that might seem uh, blatantly obvious, something that, that no one in the room could believe anything contrary. But I remember vividly being in an era of radio where on Thursday evening someone would come in with a late order for tomorrow's, tomorrow's airtime and we would agree one last time that we would take those extra ads that took us up to 17 minutes minuteage in drive time the following day. And the principles of that, uh, I guess a principle is only something... Uh, when it costs you money. And uh, the, the principle of users first, last and always is obviously definitive at Google. You'll recognise this. These are uh, from the, the first few years of Google. These were the competitor homepages uh, when, when Google was setting up. So this is what was Google was competing against. And inevitably, the conventional wisdom at the time was that, OK, well, what you've got to do, you've got to monetise your homepage. And Google's philosophy was always get people off the site as quickly as possible. So in contrast... The, that was, do you remember, that was the, an earlier look of the, the Google homepage. In contrast, that, that look and feel, that stark emptiness, represented a real point of disagreement. That They felt getting people off the site quicker was a better way to build a robust business. And it all came down to that, putting users first, last and always, and not considering users in the mix, 
always, if there is a decision, and it's, it stands today, if there's a decision, users first is the, the way that decisions are decided. Next one is say it with data. And I think you've had a, someone talking about A-B testing before. But the, the, the way that every tech firm works is decidedly governed by the power of data. And I thought I'd show an illustration of this. So you might have seen the, an A-B test before. I'm going to show you a $60 million decision. So this is from the, the Barack Obama's first inaugural election. So I'm going to show you something. And this is user participation. This is viewer participation. So what I want you to do is make a decision when you're looking at various pages and various buttons now. And I want you to decide for me which you think was the, the most effective. So this is the page that greeted anyone who searched for Barack Obama or who saw a link for him. So they came along to the website. Now, these were people, uh, on average, who donated $22. So everyone who's, who came to this page, on average, donated $22. In addition, in fact, one in every 10 of them uh, who signed up, one in every 10 of the ones who signed up also became a volunteer. So even though... Uh, this accounted for an additional $60 million revenue. In addition, it also built his whole, uh, his whole ground bottom-up um, support network. So we're going to look at different pages. So this is the first thing that greets people. And it's an illustration, really, of how powerful sometimes data can be over our own decisions. So the number of pages, number one, is Barack looking. This is a pre-election Barack Obama looking statesmanlike, and you can tell that because he's frowning and looking into the distance. Uh, second one there, overwhelmed with the, the, uh, the support of the people around him. Uh, Barack Obama, get involved. Next one there is a familial shot of Barack. He's a real man. He's got family. This one was a video. So this was a video that played. We all hear about the power of video. This was a video that played. That was Barack inviting people to join his movement. And the final one was a, a more emotive video. So this was from the Illinois um, Caucasus. And this was showing a massive uh, group of people coming out in a, a cold February to come and uh, join that Caucasus down there. So, okay, five different options. I'll, re I'll review those. So the five options were this one, statesmanlike. So that's A. B was the crowd. C was the family. D was him giving a one-to-one -one address. And E was the, uh, the Springfield Caucasus. And then you can see here, four buttons. So the four buttons, so you've got a letter and they choose a number. So number one is sign up now. Number two is learn more. Number three is sign up. No, now on that one. And the number four is join us now. Okay, so you all think you've got a perspective. Well, the one that performed best, uh, and it was almost twice as effective as the next best, was this one. So did anyone get that? Did anyone feel that that... And there's the thing. So there was about four or five hands went up. There's the thing. Sometimes our instinct, no matter how much experience we've got, doesn't direct us to the right answer because we come with too much baggage. We expect people are going to be listeners like us who listen to 30 hours a week. Or we expect that people have got a different take on things. And so the importance of, the, of data, the importance of measuring things is incredibly powerful. That decision, that switch made them $60 million. So you can see that sometimes data can be incredibly powerful. Next one is the power of auctions. I think increasingly for radio, uh, I don't know how many BBC people in the room, but in increasingly commercial, uh, commercial instincts and, and commerciality are a really important part of, of uh, the, the business that everyone's in. And what, we, uh, what a business like Google and Facebook and Twitter found is that the, w the most effective way to sell anything that you have is to sell it on an auction. The reason why is it removes buyer power, it removes some of the, anyone who studied marketing, Michael Porter's five forces. Can, uh, if, you, if you can get an auction and, and turn your sales team into building auctions, it can be incredibly powerful for trying to, to actually turn uh, interest in your favour. So uh, this was very much, uh, very, very, very much for a commercial audience, really key thing, but I, I won't dwell on it right now. The next one is about culture, and, and I think culture's a, a really key thing in terms of thinking about how ideas come about. So what you might be aware that Google often talks about, in fact, it sort of, uh, it's announced a couple of weeks ago that it had abolished what was a quite famous culture of 70-20-10. 70-20-10 was the notion that 70% of an individual's time was taken up with their main job. 
20% of their time was taken up with a project they were working on, and 10% of their time was taken up with anything they wanted. In fact, within Google, 20% time was known as Saturday, but um, the, the use of 70-20-10 time was quite a big emblematic uh, statement about how this was a different sort of culture. In fact, uh, while they've announced they've got rid of that to, to focus on key things, a, a different approach I noticed when I joined Twitter um, was, the, uh, was Hack Week. In fact, I, I'll just show you this point here. Twitter itself came from a, a, a sort of an idea session. Twitter, uh, probably adjacent to a lot of people in the room, Twitter originally came from a business called Odeo, which was a podcasting business. And, and when podcasting was the future for everyone, uh, Odeo was building the greatest way to, to receive podcasts. And then iTunes introduced podcasts and the business was destroyed overnight. So, so the company went on a management away day and uh, found themselves in a, a sort of second-rate hotel just outside San Francisco, trying to work out what to do. And the idea of Twitter came from that. So the, the notion that you could update what you were doing uh, with a single text message came from that. But here's how Twitter it tries to integrate a culture of inventiveness. They, we have something called Hack Week. And Hack Week is the first week of every quarter where everyone stops doing their current job. So... I, th I think there's a recognition that unless you find space for inventiveness and ideas, they tend not to flourish. We, we all know the realities of, of trying to do things that maybe are important but non-urgent. And actually, unless you find a space to fulfil that, that requirement, you tend not to do it. So, so I guess one way to do it is 70-20-10. Our way to do it is Hack Week. And... Um, a lot of the invention that you might have seen from Twitter this year and a lot of the invention that you'll definitely see in quarter four all comes from Hack Week projects. So it's, it's interesting how the culture is defined by that. The final one I'm going to show you is this. I adore this. Uh, and this is something that I think is probably the best understanding of how any business works today. And it, it's something, certainly, if it's not relevant to everyone in the room right now, it's increasingly relevant to recruiting the best talent. One of my favourite books over the last few years is a, a book called Drive by a guy called Dan Pink. Dan Pink's an incredible writer. He wrote another brilliant book called Whole New Mind. And he talks really about how creativity, uh, in an era where these, these five million graduates every year from China and India, creativity is one of the defining principles of how people will add value going forward into the future. So his book, Drive, and he looks at three principles of what motivates people in their lives, motivates people in work. And one of the things that he illustrates is that money alone isn't one of the defining principles. He looks at these three things. So, so I don't know if you'll recognise these three things. He says, the most important things for people in work are number one, autonomy, the sense you can get something done, you have a responsibility for something yourselves. Next one, he talks about mastery. I'm personally getting better at things. I'm better this year than I was last year. And the final one is purpose. And I think this is a really important principle for everyone in the room because sometimes uh, when you're trying to hire talent, the importance of trying to hire with purpose is really defining. So if you think, a lot of the, a lot of the tech companies uh, in Silicon Valley try to hire engineers, and routinely a great engineer, especially a, a great female engineer, will often get phone calls from the likes of Larry Page, will often get phone calls from, uh, from Mark Zuckerberg. And actually, so these people, these incredibly talented uh, computer scientists, find themselves highly coveted. And one of the things that you find... In that talent, and, and, and use that talent as, as a bellwether for other, other talents going forward, what you find in that talent is that the money alone isn't the, the motivator for those people. They want to go and do something that has impact. And purpose is increasingly starting to be that thing. So I want to do something that changes the world. I want to do something that counts for more. The reason why I say it is because back to that decision on a Thursday night when you're deciding, do we take more ads tomorrow? If people f start feeling in the team that they no longer really are doing things with a greater purpose, that's where you start getting morale uh, sagging and people no longer feeling like they're doing it for a vision and, and a, a group cause. So that book's uh, one of my favourite books and, uh, and he goes on at greater length to expand on those things. The final thing I'll end on, th on that with regards to culture is... Um, Probably a lot of you might have seen the, the work that Netflix do on culture. I'm fascinated by this because uh, the, the, the work that Netflix do is extraordinary. And, it, and anyone who searches for Netflix um, will be able to find 
a remarkable 90-page document that they published of their culture. Fascinating thing about their culture is it's not for everyone. So number one thing Netflix say is that you either perform outstandingly at your job or you will leave the company with a healthy payoff. So it's not, there's no job security at Netflix. And the reason why they say that is this. They, they, they believe they're in the most competitive industry in the world. They believe their competitors aren't just trying to compete with them, they're trying to crush them, to destroy them and to stamp on the remains. And so consequently, they have no room for anything other than outstanding. One of the things in the Netflix document says that every, every employee's expectation should be that they work with awesome colleagues. And, and well, f- forgive the Americanization of, of that language, you can see that they, they really strongly believe it. But it's fascinating because... That culture is clearly not for everyone. Sometimes people start believing that culture should be this benign, uh, polite thing that everyone could go along with. That, you know, we're going to have an away day, we're going to go and play a sports day in the park, we're going to have a conference at the end of the year. Actually, what I love about the Netflix culture is it's the antithesis of that. Their culture is, this might not be for you. And so it's, it's fascinating. It's definitely worth reading um, reading that, certainly I think the learning of Netflix is that culture doesn't have to be vanilla. So what I've, I, what I've aimed to do is give you an excursion into uh, to five things that I've learned. Like I say, I, I don't feel like I'm in any position to lecture or um, to try and uh, prescribe these things, but certainly the things that I've picked up in the, the time that I've been away from radio. Thank you very much. <laughs> One of the great things about uh, all the stuff that we're hearing today is that whether you're a big national brand or whether you're a little local station, um, there's something for you. Well, I was really interested in listening and hearing about how language and simple things when you're doing social media where you write things, the impact they can have and how much more of a response you can actually get from just changing the simple way that you write something. To be able to lead with something that you can immediately put into practice is really, really helpful. This is Next Radio. Next Radio. With broadcast by Onyx. Innovative solutions for creative people.